Associate Professor and Chair of the Research and Biostatistics Department at the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine. He has a PhD from Virginia Commonwealth University and a Master's from University of Michigan in Biostatistics and a Bachelor's from Brigham Young University in Statistics. And he's going to talk to us about the power of statistical thinking in the discovery and development of biological products. Thank you. All right, well, th well thank, thank you, um, Jason. Thank you for inviting me here. It's great to be here. I was, um, I was just saying that I, I grew up in Ashland, Oregon, and there's a Southern Oregon University there. My dad was a professor in the biology department, and I grew up hearing about they would go and play this, this college called Albertson's College, and I always wondered where it was. And now, of course, the name's changed, College of Idaho, and, or maybe changed back, right? Um, and so it's, it's actually great to be here. This is my, my, my first time. So today what I want to talk to you about, so I'm a biostatistician. Uh, I worked, uh, now I work at ICOM, the Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine. Anybody here who has applied to ICOM by any chance? Okay. Um, I know we've had some local uh, applicants from Northwest Nazarene, wasn't sure about uh, College of Idaho. Um, before that, I was at Washington State uh, in Pullman, where I started a statistical consulting center. And then previous to that, for 10 years, I worked in biotech. So my talk is today is going to be talking about the development and discovery of uh, biologicals. I understand that just recently you had a, a similar type of talk. Uh, maybe not a similar talk, but, but a similar topic, perhaps. So. Again, I'm a biostatistician. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to define statistical thinking for you today. And um, then I'm going to take you through a few just quick applications and then a couple of little bit deeper dives um, for case studies and we'll be sure to get you out of here by 6.30 for sure. All right, so let's start with the game show. This was one of my favorites as a kid. It's still, it's uh, still on cable somewhere. You can find it. The Family Feud. So here's the idea. You know, you ask a hundred people a question. It's a survey, and uh, there's two teams. They're both families, and they try to guess the top like five or seven answers. And the team who gets the most points, who guesses the most, uh, most the highest proportion of the uh, of the respondents to the survey wins. So we're going to play this game. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> so I went around and I asked 100 scientists and I said, name something that a statistician contributes to scientific research. Okay, this is your, this is your opportunity. What do you think statisticians do? Just yell it out. Crunch numbers. Crunch numbers! Oh my goodness! There we go. Analyze data. Crunch numbers. <laughs> what else? You guys are speechless. That's all you can think of, right? Any other guesses? Okay, how about this one? Calculate sample size, do power calculations. It's something that people talk a lot about what statisticians do. How about design experiments? You ever thought about a statistician like designing an experiment? Isn't that what scientists do? Okay. Massage the data? <laughs> right? Um, three people said that. <laughs> that would be political research. What's that? That would be political research. Okay. Political research? <laughs> right, right. Okay, and there was one person, left, one person who answered, understand and reduce variation. What are they talking about? Understand and reduce variation. Is that what statisticians do? Well, about 30 years ago or something, uh, a statistician coined this phrase, uh, statistical thinking. And it, it has to do with these three things, that all work occurs in a system of interconnected processes. That variation exists in all those pro processes, and that understanding and reducing variation are the keys to success. 
So what does this mean? Well, first of all, what's an interconnected process? So let's start out easy. Like think about the human body, right? You've got the musculoskeletal system, you've got respiratory, cardiovascular, all these things that are continually working together. Um, think about any kind of biological system, um, any ecological system, there's lots of things. Think about your, your commute to school, whether you're walking, riding your bike, driving, right? This is an interconnected process with lots of things happening, other traffic, construction, um, other drivers, traffic lights, stop signs, all those things. Your time that you, it takes for you to get from home to, to school is going to be different a little bit every day. Right? There's variation in that. So variation exists in, in all these processes. And so if there's variation, that means there's uncertainty. Um, and so if we can understand and reduce the variation, then we're going to be successful. Because we're going to understand more of what, what's happening. We're going to be able to have greater knowledge. Um, another way to think about it is that variation leads to uncertainty, which leads to risk. Risk because we don't understand what's happening. Risk we might make a poor decision. So, you know, I understand that this is a, a colloquium about natural sciences and mathematics. And so what we're going to talk about today is really a combination of those. Uh, statistical thinking to uh, drug development uh, for, for biologicals. But first of all, let's start with a different example. I want to help you understand what this is about. So it's, it's making a car, right? Manufacturing a car. That's a very interconnected process. So the car you drive or that you want to drive is not manufactured. I mean, the, the parts for that car come from, could come from all over the world. It could be manufactured in one spot, shipped to another. This is a, a very complex pro process. If one supplier is late, then maybe that assembly line isn't going to be working, right? Um, so it's a very complex process. Um, I can tell you the story about two sides of the Pacific Ocean. So we got here in the United States, specifically Detroit, with the American car manufacturers, and over in Japan. So what was happening in the 1970s in the United States in terms of car manufacturing? You guys, uh, you guys see any of these cars around? <laughs> when I was in college, one of my friends had one of these down here. This is a, a Gremlin. <laughs> that was the actual name, and it, it didn't work very well either. <laughs> uh, this, this little kind of lime green is a Ford Pinto. And this is a, a Plymouth uh, K car. My family had one of these. This, and it was like kind of lemon colored, and it was definitely a lemon. Like we bought it new, and it just like fell apart immediately. <laughs> like, um, so during the 70s, US man car manufacturers were known for making the muscle cars and all these other type of cars, but the reliability really wasn't that good. Um, on the other side of the, the Pacific, the Japanese car companies were starting to manufacture cars, to design and manufacture cars that were really high quality. Um, in the 1950s, there was a quality engineer and statistician by the name of Edward Demi. He went to the, Jap the Japanese car companies and said, look, I can teach you about how to reduce variation and understand what's happening in your manufacturing process. And they were very eager to listen to him. And it took about 20 years for their quality to improve. Um, Professor Deming went to the U.S. manufacturers and they were like, they weren't interested. Like, we, we got this. So, you, when you do manufacturing, you, you have uh, specifications you have to meet. And the U.S. manufacturers said, you know what, as long as that part is within the specification, I'm, I'm, we're, we're totally fine. The Japanese manufacturers said, you know what, it's not okay if that, that part is just within the specification. It should hit the target every time. Because if it's on one side or the other side of the specification, chances are that some of those parts aren't going to quite fit together well, and they're going to break down faster. So we want to hit the target every time. So anybody under 30, can you tell me the make and model of the blue car? <laughs> Any guesses? That blue car is a Honda Civic. Okay, so that was an early Honda Civic from the 1970s. What about the red car? Make and model? 
Toyota Corolla. Toyota Corolla. Okay. So in the 70s, the Japanese didn't really have the design down. Like this really flashy design wasn't really there. They started making these cars that were uh, much more reliable than American manufacturers. And this came to a head because Ford decided to make one of its transmissions, the same transmission in the United States and in Japan. And just after a few years, all the US, they started having lots of complaints and problems with the transmissions made in the United States, but not with those made in Japan. What had happened? The Japanese manufacturers had figured out how to understand the variation in their process and how to reduce it uh, so that they didn't have problems, right? Now they didn't have any problems, but they were much more consistent and reliable. And so finally the American manufacturers had to catch up when they realized what was happening. The same concept of understanding and reducing variation like any of your favorite brands. So the companies that make these brands here, they all have statisticians or quality engineers, Six Sigma engineers, who they spend their careers doing this, trying to figure out, let's make this, this product a little bit better. Let's, let's try to optimize it. So that same, that, those same concepts can be applied to the development of, um, of biologicals. And that's what I'll spend some time talking about today. So there's really three steps or stages in this process. The first one is the process design. And so a, a biological drug is, is made in living cells. So who's heard of uh, any like chemical engineers here or you guys have that major? Or um, um, the idea is, you guys probably learned this in biology, right? That we can take some sort of vector and, and, and Biologicals, a lot of times they use Chinese hamster ovary cells. And they can engineer that, right, to um, grow a certain, like, you know, to, to genetically engineer it to grow like an antibody, a monoclonal antibody that has some, you know, specific uh, target or um, specific binding sites, right, that it's looking for. And so, that's done a lot with biologicals when these, these CHO cells and they're engineered to create monoclonal antibodies that are specific for something in your body. Right? The, this medication is going to work by finding that target and doing whatever its mechanism of action is. So in this, this red stage one, what happens is biologists, uh, the uh, chemical engineers will get together and they'll design this process. And little bioreactors, two liter bioreactors where you put all this cell culture and you start growing, you start you're growing your medication. Right? Of course, there's lots of other things in there. It's got to be purified. And there's lots of steps to do it. But that's stage one. Stage two is once you figure out how to do that, and you've shown that this drug actually works by giving it to humans, then you scale up this process. You go from two liters to like 2,000 liters, or 10,000 liters, or 15,000 liters. Like something that would be, you know, like this giant, imagine a giant stainless steel um, reactor that's like as tall as the ceiling and, you know, like three or four feet in, uh, in diameter, something like that. And that's not three or four, it's, it's, farther, it's bigger than that. So. so then you have to qualify your process, show that it works. You do an engineering run where you actually just run through and make sure you get what you're hoping to get. And then hopefully your drug gets approved by the FDA. They say, yes, this is safe and efficacious for use in humans. So now you can manufacture this and sell this and give it to patients who actually need it. And that's stage three, where you begin actually uh, manufacturing um, for commercial purposes, for actually selling it to the public. So during that process, during these different stages, as you can see in the top, there's four types of statistical methods that are really used often to understand and reduce variation. So I'll quickly go through each of these. So design of experiments is the, is the first. Oh, and I'm going to be using as an example, um, so I worked for about five years in Seattle with a company called Seattle Genetics. And they developed this drug right here, which is at Cetris. It is what's called an antibody drug conjugate. So it's a monoclonal antibody. You grow in this in cell culture. It's specific to CD30. So this is just a marker on certain, on certain cells. It turns out that there's this disease called Hodgkin lymphoma. 
is, is noted because it has um, CD30 positive cells. So CD30 is sitting on, as a receptor, is sitting on these cells. And so Ecetris will go as a, as, a, as an antibody that's connected to a chemotherapy drug. So going through your body and it finds this cancer cell that has CD30, it attaches, it goes inside the cell, and then the chemotherapy is released and it kills that cell. Um, that's the design. It's like, kind of like a little bit like a smart bomb. Sometimes it doesn't always hit its target, right? It has off-target effects as well. But we'll talk about um, these things. So design of experiments. Imagine that you wanted to bake chocolate souffle. How would you do it? Anybody have a recipe for this? We start with a recipe, but how do you know that your recipe is the best? Right? So design of experiments is a way, a mathematically optimal way, of sort of figuring out the best recipe. Okay? So you might take the ingredient, the inputs that you have. There could be different types of ingredients, different amounts. Maybe the order of mixing these things together. Maybe there's some method. How long are you going to bank it? At what temperature? Right? All those things could be optimized to come out with your outputs. So the best taste. Um, maybe like the fewest calories or something. I don't know. Maybe that's not important with, with chocolate supply. But so design of experiments is this idea of how can we design an experiment in such a way that mathematically it's going to be optimal, right? That we'll be able to optimize our process to get the best product every time. And what you can do with that, um, so this is an example from a process development. Like we're trying not, not to, you know, make chocolate souffle here, but we're trying to optimize, get the highest yield from this, from this process. So we have pH and sodium chloride, some kind of dilution here. This is an antibody purification. We're trying to strip away all the bad stuff, basically, and just um, keep our antibody. And so we run an experiment at different levels, at different combinations of these two variables. And then we can construct this statistically. We can create a statistical model that allows us to model this response surface. It allows us to make predictions at anywhere along um, on the surface. So that we could say, well, our yield looks like it's going to be highest here, and maybe lowest here. So we want to stay away from these areas. Okay. So this is just one tool to understand. Um, and I should say this is a, also not also a way to figure out which variables are actually important, which factors in our experimental process are, are meaningful. Now this is just another look at it. Instead of looking at the surface, we can kind of we can just cut slices from that surface, kind of like a topographical map. Um, another one is called variance components analysis. So let me tell you a little bit of, of a story here. Um, on this y-axis here is percent high molecular weight. So when you, when you grow this, this antibody up, you only want it just to be one antibody, a single, single antibody floating around. But every once in a while you can get one of the, one of this, so the antibody kind of looks like a Y. It's got these two arms. And every once in a while the, one of the arms will get cut, cut off. And, it's, and so you have a fragment. That, that would be low um, molecular weight. So it's lower than the molecular weight should for, the, for that, uh, that molecule should be. And, and then sometimes you get high molecular weight. Well, you get two or three of these antibodies that will aggregate and, and um, I don't know what kind of bonds they form, but they just kind of stick together. Okay. So this is what we, what we want to see is something that's very low, right? We want low high molecular weight that we don't, that's, that's an impurity of the, in the process. And this is what we saw, that over time, these blue dots, these are real data points here. They're around 2%. Everything in green is between 1% and 2%. And so the question was, well, what's going on? So a variance components analysis is just a way to take the different components that are causing the variation and figure out from, from where, it, where it's coming from. So in this case, we looked at some of the suppliers that was going into the raw materials. And it turned out that supplier two was always low. And supplier one was always high. And supplier three is a little bit of a mixed bag. So maybe we don't understand everything, but this is a simple example of how uh, sort of separating or partitioning the variability from 
you know, between suppliers and within suppliers helps us identify maybe where we want to investigate next. Um, this is a similar example. So um, in that process, we create an analytical method that is, um, which one was this? Um, I can't remember which one this was. But we're looking for some other impurity in the method. And you know, we, we would like this to be consistent. Um, and you know, we see a lot of variability and, and some data points around here. Well, it, it turns out that these are different analysts. And you can see that analyst two and analyst six are always above the average, and analyst five and analyst three are always below the average. They should be sort of the same value every time. And in this assay, same value, you should get the same value every time. And so with there's, of course, there's variability. Um, and so this idea of partitioning it for between analysts, maybe these analysts need, maybe they need a little bit more training or something like that. Right? So this is an, uh, just another example. Um, most people probably think that a uh, drug manufacturer, when they get approval from the FDA to, to sell this medication, they know a lot about it. And they, they do know something, but it's the surprising reality is that there's a lot of things that they don't know. In fact, they, we talk about it as the iceberg effect, that you can only really know, sort of like, it's analogous to only being able to see the, the top of the iceberg. You don't know how really how big it is in the, the bottom. And this is sort of another way of looking at that, that before you get approval, this is about what you know, and then you start manufacturing and giving it to you know, thousands or tens of thousands of patients, and you learn a lot more about your drug. In fact, this et cetera drug, we thought we understood the mechanism of action. There are all these patients that were responding to this medication. They, they had cancer, and we were giving it to them, and it was going away, and there was, uh, it really shouldn't have happened, because they didn't have a whole lot of cells in their body with CD30. We started giving it to other cancers. And so there were other mechanisms that were happening that we, we didn't understand. But um, one of the, one of the, uh, the tools here is called statistical process control. And you, maybe you've heard of control charts. And this is the idea where you would just plot chronologically every like, batch of material that you manufactured. And you would just um, plot the value of whatever you're measuring. So another property of the, um, when you have a biological, is its charge variance. Okay, um, in this case, we're looking, uh, you can use chromatography methods, like analytical chemistry methods, to figure out uh, whether it's a basic charge or an acidic charge. Um, and you don't really care necessarily if it's high or low, but you just want it to be consistent over time. Uh, because you've run your clinical trials with a certain level and you want it to, to stay the same. And so control charts are very useful. We just plot the data over time. You can see it's going up and down. And then at some point, it goes higher and, and then it stayed higher. So this is another way of saying, hey, there's some variation in this process that we don't understand, so we need to go in and, um, and look at it. Um, here's another example. So this is what we, this is an example of a control chart. We were measuring, so we had this uh, manufacturing site in Scotland. And um, as part of the, um, to get a good, like to get a good product quality, what we would call, we have also things that go into the process called process parameters. And the process parameters need to be within certain ranges to be able to say, yeah, this is, this is gonna lead to, to good product quality. And one of those process parameters for this, for this manufacturing process was the temperature, the, the, uh, the batch temperature. So I don't know exactly how they did it, if it was like by sensors, or they just stuck like some kind of like temperature gauge in there. And anyway, you see like it's pretty consistent at times, and it's also consistent at other times, but then sometimes it goes really low, and it bounces all around, and then you see at the end this, this downward trend. So this is a case where we we have unwanted variation, like what is happening? We don't understand this. Um, so what we ended up doing is we said, well, um, maybe it just correlates with the the month or the season of the year. And you, if you'll notice here in the month between this is the months uh, you know January to December, 
So April to October, it was always above the average except one time here. And then in November, December, January, February, it was always below. And then March, it looks like it's maybe trending up again. It looks like there's like this seasonal pattern. So what's going on here? Well, it turned out that part of this process, you had to add water. And water was not kept in the manufacturing suite. It was kept in a different building. It was not temperature controlled. And so instead of bringing the water into the manufacturing suite and warming it to room temperature, they just kind of threw it in there. And during the winter time, it was colder, right? Um, and so we started having problems, right? Um, it's unwanted variation. Now, now we understand. You got to bring the, the water to room temperature before you before you add it. Okay. Last example here: multivariate analysis. <coughs> multivariate is this idea you have lots of like response variables, lots of measurements that you're making on on lots of different variables that you're measuring. You want to understand the relationship between all of them. Um, so we did this analysis. I won't go into it. This is a principal component analysis. And we started noticing this pattern. Um, the relative position of, uh, these are actually batches of material, indicates how similar they are. The closer together they are, the more similar, the farther apart, the more, the more different they are. What we noticed is that 2008, they sort of congregated together, 2009, 2010, 2011. We're seeing this year to year to year variation. So what's happening? Well, we had tons of data. We had like 70,000 data points. And so I'm not going to go over all these in depth, but we saw this thing out here. Oh, this acidic, this acidic variance is going up. What's, what's going on? We crunched a whole bunch of numbers. and. You know, we were able to come up with, say, hey, you know what? It could be our media filter. We're not filtering properly. It could be something in this cell culture, this nutrient metabolite. Maybe we're, we're putting too much in there. It could be the cell density that we're starting at. Anyway, we had some, we were able to take all this variation that's happening and identify some areas we need to go in and, and make these more consistent. So that's a really a quick overview of how to use statistics in the development of uh, biologicals. Um, so I hope, any math majors here? Or, okay, we got some math majors, yes, yes. Does everybody else like biology? Pretty much, okay. Um, so, this is trying to show you that math can be used in biology, right? <laughs> so let me, let me just dive in a little bit deeper to a couple um, case studies. Again, this uh, again in this this example is again using etc. So proteins are difficult to characterize because they have a three-dimensional structure. So it does it doesn't be you know as long as if you have a chemical structure usually like with a with a um, like a tablet like a drug you take in a tablet. All you really care about is getting the chemical structure right. Um, or, you know, uh, but, but, but peptides and, and proteins, it's not just having the amino, amino acids in the right structure. They've got to fold correctly and bend right. And so we can measure all these things like high molecular weight and acidic and all those things, but we still actually don't know if that protein has its mechanism, mechanism of action, if it's actually active, it's actually, if it's actually going to do what it's supposed to do when it gets in the bloodstream and it's moving around. So the way we look at that is through um, these things called bioassays, biological assays. Um, and, and what we were looking at here is a, what's called a relative potency assay. You're looking at the, the potency of a certain batch of drug versus a standard or a reference that you know what the potency is. And you want it, in, in our world, we want it to be about 100%, because I would say it's the same as it's been previously. Okay, so the bioassays um, tell us whether the drug is active. They're difficult and time consuming to develop because we're talking about a biological system and there's just tons of variability. And for oncology products, products what we usually want to do is kill the cancer cells. And so we usually design cytotoxicity assays. They basically measure how many cells we can kill. 
So they look, um, and this is sort of a brief description for an antibody drug conjugate. So here's our antibody, kind of looks like this Y shaped here, it's two arms. And then all these stars here are the chemotherapy drugs that are attached to it. So there's some kind of linker that, that's connecting the antibody with um, the, the chemotherapy drug. And so it's going through, you know, whether it's the bloodstream or if you have a 96 well plate and it's just in the, the media within that well of the plate, it's going through and it's looking for this antigen on the, on the cell surface. And in this case, it's trying to find the CD30. And it's going to bind there, it's going to be internalized, go into that cell. The chemotherapy drugs are going to be released and that cell will die. And when that happens, you get something like this. So this is the concentration of that antibody, or that antibody drug conjugate. The more you add, the signal that you're measuring, which is the, how many cells there are, is going down. Okay, so when you don't have any antibody there, you have this, this, um, you know, this higher signal. This could be um, optical density, it could be fluorescence, it could be luminescence, it could be any kind of signal you want. These are actually all in like a log scale. Um, and then as you increase the concentration, you get cell killing. Now, so I had a couple scientists come to me with these data. There's about 200 curves here. And they said, we've been working on this assay for like a year. And all these curves are supposed to be completely overlaid. And what we're seeing is this huge difference. So, you know, again on the log scale, this is a huge difference between this lower asymptote. So like maximum cell killing. And then when you have no drug in there at all, um, there's still a lot of variability. And you see also that the, the slopes of these curves are really different. So this one is super steep, and this one is very shallow. So I said, how can we make this, so how can we get this, this the, all these curves just overlay? I said, well, design of experiments, right? They said, oh, we don't have time for that. Like, We've got to have this assay ready in like two weeks. <laughs> so I said, can you just take, can you tell us what concentrations we should run in our assay? In other words, tell us where to start, tell us uh, the concentration of the antibody up here, and tell us what types of dilutions we need to make to put concentrations along this curve. So that if we get any of these curves, we can at least fit them pretty well, okay? So how would you do that? Right? This is not an optimal situation. We'd really like to reduce this variation. Um, so let's get into uh, for the math majors. I'll give you a little. Bit, I'll give you one formula. Okay. So we fit these curves using a nonlinear model. Just nonlinear means that it's not linear in these parameters. And what's important is that um, there's no closed form out, um, closed form solution to these things. So what you do is you start with an estimate of the parameters and you start iterating and you sort of move in a direction that, that um, in this case minimizes the sum of squared errors but we won't go there anymore so tell me what happens when this concentration equals zero what's going to happen so if this is zero um, this denominator is going to be one so d plus a minus d is just a so when the concentration is zero the value is going to be A, and that's, so that's going to be the, our parameter that estimates an upper asymptote. You do the same thing with the concentration when it's like really, really, really big. This denominator is going to be really large, and so this whole term will be basically be zero, and so we're going to be left with D. So D is going to be, whoops, oh, I guess I have another, another formula too from the math people. Um, D is going to be this, this lower asymptote down here. Um, B here is, uh, is the slope, so like I said before, some are steep, some are shallow, um, and C is our EC50, or effective concentration 50. So what that means is it's halfway, it's, it's half of the signal between the high and the low, and it's the concentration that would give you that signal, okay? So it's going to be somewhere between like... 7 and, I don't know, 60 or something like that. 
So this is the, the nonlinear model that we're using to fit all these curves. And the way we ended up solving this was something called a maximin deoptimal design. So I'm going to walk you through it really carefully. If your eyes glaze over, that's okay. All right. <coughs> so maximin, what does this mean? Max, maxa, like <coughs> maximum, like the best. Min, like the worst. So the idea behind this is that it's the best, worst case design. Design here means the set of concentrations in these dilutions that we've that we've created. So it's the set of the set of design points, the set of the concentrations with the, the maximum of the worst de-efficiency. Let me, let me just walk you through this. Um, especially for the math people. So um, here's the idea. We want the maximum um, of the minimum de-efficiency. So de-efficiency is, uh, I, think I, I think maybe this is a little bit too complex. The idea behind this is that this number is going to be between, between 0 and 1. The closer it is to 1, the, the, the better it is. And the closer it is to 0, the worse it is. So we want the de-efficiencies to be close to 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to check um, over, uh, we're going to find the minimum of these de-efficiencies. Let me just show you the picture, okay? <laughs> this is what we did. Um, so we, we said, okay, over here we have n, n possible designs. This might be a million, a million different ways that you can choose, you know, these concentrations between 0 0.1 and like whatever that number was on the upper side, like 10,000. Okay? And for each of these curves, we're going to look at all of these million designs. And we're going to cal calculate something called the generalized variance and the de-efficiency. And we're going to do that like a million times. Then we're going to do the same thing for the second curve, and the third curve, and the fourth curve. And I kind of ran out of here with 10. We could do that for 200 if we wanted to. And then we're going to look across all of these, ten, say, 10 curves for each design. And we're going to calculate the minimum of those de-efficiencies for each of those 10 de-efficiencies. And we're going to do that n times, like a million times. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to take the maximum of those minimums, okay? What that ends up doing is it gives us the best of the worst case. In other words, remember all these weird shapes that we had? The w worst case would be the design that fits, um, is, is the, the idea behind this is that the worst case is um, something we don't want. And so we want the best of, of, of the worst case, okay? So, anyway, this is maybe a little bit more than uh, maybe that you wanted to learn. <laughs> but the idea behind this is that we had all this, un, uh, this, this misunderstood or not understood variation. And now we're just trying to, to choose concentrations that will allow us to fit all of these curves. So once we did this, um, you know, we still had this variation. So we still had some of these curves that were... You know, very different in the lower asymptote than the upper asymptote, but we're able to choose now nine, nine concentrations that helped us um, fit all of these curves well, which wasn't happening before. Okay, math people can come up afterwards and we'll talk. <laughs> okay, so this is more for the biology people. So now an example from drug discovery. Now this is earlier in my career. Um, Anybody know who uh, discovered insulin? 1921. Pasteur. What's that? Louis Pasteur. Uh, good guess. Good guess. By a guy the, by the name of Bantine. I uh, can't remember his first name. Maybe Frederick. He was a Canadian physician, and he had a medical student. Can you imagine um, whose name was Best? Last name was Best. So can you imagine being a medical student and just like discovering insulin? Like, like amazing, right? It's almost 100 years ago. And so I think most people know that people with type 1 diabetes can't produce their own insulin. So they've got to take insulin uh, injections, right? But what most people don't know is that in your pancreas, the beta cells, they also secrete another hormone. It wasn't discovered until 1987. 
That hormone is called amyloin. It's co-secreted with insulin. Um, it helps regulate your blood sugar <coughs> while you're eating, right? So you need the insulin um, to be able to take that glucose, right? But also the amylin, it helps it helps even out the swings from high to low in blood sugar. For those who um, don't have it, they tend to like drop fast or rise high, you know, rise quickly and drop fast, right? So amylin helps, um, does a bunch of things, but that's one of the things that it, um, it helps um, even out those, those swings. So 1987, a company that was called amylin was formed to turn this, um, to turn this into uh, a medication that could be used. And they were eventually successful. The FDA approved their medication. Uh, the brand name is called Similin. Uh, the the uh, scientific name is Pramlantide. It was approved in 2005. Um, so they had about 18 years of like clinical trials where they're trying to develop this drug. It took a long time to develop it. Also, 1995, there was this drug, or this uh, hormone it was discovered called leptin. Anybody heard of leptin? Okay, so this was just like 20 years ago. Like it's amazing, right? This was this is the satiety hormone, right? That it helps you feel full. And the, and so once this was, was discovered, this big biotech company called Amgen said, you know what? We can cure like obesity, right? We're just going to give people tons and tons of leptin, and they're never going to eat, right? <laughs> And um, so that's what they tried. I started in 1995. Um, but I, so I joined Amelon in 2005, and um, we started looking at uh, combination, uh, drug combinations for treating obesity. So that's what the next story I'm going to tell you. Um, the interesting thing about Amelon is that when they did these 18 years of clinical trials in patients with type 1 diabetes, they noticed that the patients were losing weight. Yeah, maybe four or five percent of their body weight. It wasn't huge, but it was pretty consistent. Uh, and so they started doing research in rodents to try to figure out what was going on. Uh, but they, they came to the conclusion that amylin or pramlantide by itself is not going to cause significant weight loss. People tended to like plateau. And like, even if they were on, on uh, pramlantide for two years, they only lost like 4% of their body weight. Meanwhile, leptin was going to be this magic bullet that was going to cure obesity. And so Amgen spent, I don't know what it was, hundreds of millions of dollars testing. Um, the synthetic form was called metroleptin. And it really, it, it totally failed. Like they just kept on giving more and more and more and nothing happened. Um, it was a huge, huge disappointment. And what happened was there was resistance to it. The more you gave it, the less the body cared about it. And so it didn't work at all. But um, before I got there, there was um, some scientists who were studying this. And they said, what about, they kind of understood some of the mechanisms of amylin and leptin. They knew that they were operating on different parts of the brain. They said, what if we combine these drugs? Maybe, maybe leptin actually will help reduce weight, but it has to be unlocked somehow. Like, it just needs, it needs something to, to trigger its, it, its effect. And so they started doing rodent, re, um, rodent experiments. And so these were done in um, DIO rats, or diet-induced obesity-prone rats. So I think there's some kind of genetic modification here to make them be prone, pre- Dis, um, have predisposition to gain a lot of weight. And so they started doing these experiments um, here in, uh, so this is over about two weeks, and they were measuring how much food the, the, the rats were eating every day. So uh, in white here is just the vehicle control group. So this is, they were just given saline solution. So what they do is they take these little tiny pumps and they actually imp implant them somehow in their, in their back or something. And there's this kind of this infusion of either saline or the drug actually going through. So the vehicle, um, you can see this is, this is how much food they ate. It was pretty consistent every day. 
Um, the group in orange here is the leptin. And as you can see, it didn't have a whole big, didn't have a, a, a big effect on, on what they ate. The blue and the green are actually overlaid here. I'll talk about the blue first. So this is amylin at this specific dose right here, 100 micrograms per kilogram per day. And they staggered this experiment. So on day one, they looked at how much, on average, the, uh, the rats ate on day one. And then on day two, they started this pear-fed amylin group, meaning they only gave the rats the same amount of food that the amylin rats ate on day one. So they staggered the experiment. So when amylin was on day two, the pear-fed amylin was on day one. And then two, one, three, two, and, and so on. So in other words, the pear-fed amylin means that they only ate as much as the amylin group ate on the previous day. You can see that they, that amylin by itself reduces uh, food intake. So these rats are eating less. Interestingly, this red here is a combination of amylin and leptin. And as you can see, there's a, a, a really dramatic reduction in how much they're eating compared to the green. And, and you know, if you were to add the reduction in the orange and the green, well, maybe that would add up to, to the red, but maybe actually that reduction is, is greater. So here's what happened to their body weight. So this is normalized for the control group. Um, so the control group is, is, on average, there's no gain or no change in their body weight. So leptin, uh, maybe they lost 1% to 2%, which is what Amgen saw in their trials, that it basically had essentially no effect. Um, the amylin group and the pear-fed amylin group were essentially uh, almost overlapped. Um, but the uh, amylin leptin group, they ended up losing 12% of their body fat. Now, these rats, when you lose 12% of your body fat, you are like a buff rat. It's like amazing. They, they have like 2% like body fat. And, and, you know, so they're, and the thing is that they, were, they weren't losing water either. They were losing fat. Um, and so all of a sudden, we thought, we might have something here. Like, this is, this is amazing. Because we can't explain this just by eating less. Because this, this green, the, the pear-fed group, um, they lost about the same amount as amylin. In other words, you can lose weight if you take amylin, but there's a limit to it. And it's just, it's just due to not eating as much. But with leptin, you're really not going to lose any weight. But when you combine them, all of a sudden, you get this dramatic reduction. Okay, so we decided we need to prove this hypothesis because if this really works, we need to buy leptin from Amgen, and we need to combine these two because this is going to make this is going to be an, you know this is going to be unbelievable. People are going to lose a ton of weight. All right, that was, that's what we were thinking. And so we designed this study called the Escalade study. Call it Escalade because it costs about the same as going out and buying an Escalade. So we had us we had enough money for 60 rats. Um, there was a desire to have about five um, rats per group, so we could have 12 groups. And our objective was to determine whether um, amylin, amylin and leptin are synergistic. So the question is, how do you choose the dose combinations? Right, you got 12 groups. Which combinations are you going to choose? So this is where this, the, the math part, the statistics part comes in. So we had some more requirements. The dose of leptin needed to be low enough not to show any effect. So these rats, because they had this genetic predisposition, if you gave them lots of leptin, they would lose lots of weight. So we had to keep that dose pretty, um, pretty low. We also needed a dose of amylin that was sort of, that would give us, we, we wanted reproducibility in these results. So we wanted to be able to, just give a dose of amylin and get something similar to what we had gotten historically so we could feel like, hey, these results are consistent. For statistical reasons, this response surface that I'll show you a picture of in a second had to be linear. And also we needed this window to, to show this synergy, to show this additional um, weight loss. Um, we had some data, so I ended up doing, spending like an entire day just trying to going over all these combinations, finally I felt like I've got the combinations that's going to solve 
this mystery and test this hypothesis. So we get in to do the experiment, and as sometimes happens in science, um, the technician messed up one of the doses. Like it was, she actually gave half the dose she was supposed to give for um, <coughs> of like amylin for everything. And so when I found out about it, I was like, oh, I was just crushed. But it turned out to be like one of these good things, right? That you just like get lucky sometimes. <clears throat> okay. So here's our possible outcomes. Um, additivity. So if you if you take a plus b, what are you going to get? This is the, the question we were asking. And one plus leptin, what do you get? Do you get the sum of those two, or do you get something greater or something less? So additivity means just a plus b equals the sum of a plus b. Antagonism, uh, antagonism is when you get something worse than you would expect by just adding the two together. And synergy is you get something much, much better. So it kind of looks like a kite. Um, square, kite, like, I don't know. Flying carpet. Um, <laughs> So this is what we got. So first of all, on the left, on, on body weight, um, leptin by itself, we had essentially no difference on average. It doesn't matter how much leptin you give, up to 100 micrograms per kilogram per day, no, no weight loss. If you give amylin, we actually saw a little bit more than we had expected to. Um, we saw about 7 8%. But the combination, we saw 15% weight loss, like incredible. Um, food intake, we didn't see this like linear pattern, but um, similar type of results where we saw this synergistic effect. Right? We started to see this like kite shape. Um, and both of these were statistically significant. We said we've got something real here. So based on this experiment, um, we, Amblin actually went to Amgen and said we want to buy Metroleptin from you. And they were like, whatever, we just spent hundreds of millions of dollars, you're wasting your money. And I was actually just Googling it today, trying to figure out how much we spent on it. I think it was like 25 million, which seems like a lot, but it's really nothing. Um, so we were so excited. We um, did this clinical trial. So we took, um, I think it was men and women, who were, you know, had a certain body mass index or something that were um, categorized as obese. And we gave them combinations, we gave them leptin by itself, pramlin, or amylin or pramlintide by itself, and then we gave them certain combinations. And um, I won't go over the results in, in detail, but here, here, here's what happened. So pramlintide plus leptin, that combination at the highest dose, they lost about 11% of their body weight. The surprising thing was that people with pramlintide, they lost about 5%. But those with leptin alone also lost about 5%. So if you add 5% and 5%, well, it's 10. That's pretty close to what we got with the combination. But our results with leptin had never been seen before. And we think it was because we also gave them a behavioral modification. So they were doing things to help them lose weight. And so we think that that changed our leptin response. If you, if you just got like a sugar pill, basically, I mean, just a, like, an injection with nothing in it, you actually gain weight, about 2%. Um, so we were pretty excited about this. We thought this would work. Um, but the problem with, with this is that you're having to give yourself four injections a day. So how many of you want to give yourself four injections a day? <laughs> um, not very fun. And so they decided um, not to pursue this anymore. And so and M1 no longer exists. And leptin's out there, it's been sold different places. People are still trying to like unlock this magic bullet. But it really did work. It, this combination of M1 and leptin really, um, at least this was a proof of concept that it actually could be done. Okay, so last slide. Um, so, you know, I talked about statistical thinking, right? It's this idea that we can seek to reduce and understand variation. This last case study I, I, was, I was telling you about, this is another example of variation. Like, where is the variability coming from? Like, and, and how can we um, impact it? Um, so I want to give a shout out to everybody who's thinking about like a quantitative, you know, major or maybe even graduate school. Statistical thinking is used in, in many fields to improve products and discover new treatments. So thank you so much for your time. I'll take any questions.
there any questions for Todd? So that was the only way that you guys could uh, deliver the dosage was through an injection and there wasn't any oral way to... Yeah, great question. So we talked about that, right? Like you can, you know, do all sorts of things like transdermal where you just have this patch, right? And it just kind of like seeps in through your skin and the muscle, and like intermuscular type of, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing it. And essentially, um, Amel and the company was running into some financial problems and they just didn't have the resources to put behind it. But that's a great question because we think there, there, there could be better ways. Uh, one of the things we were looking at is instead of one in, like two injections a day of leptin, of uh, doing a monthly injection. So it would be a giant needle, right? Because you'd have to give a whole bunch of, of, um, of the drug, but there's different ways, there's different technology to allow that drug to slowly sort of leak out um, once it's inside your body. So there's lots of different ways of delivering drugs and yeah. I think it could be successful. But I'm biased. So. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so when you were talking about the statistical controls, what I, I may have missed it. What did you say about uh, multivariate analysis, or did we kind of? Yeah. So that's a very generic term, multivariate analysis. It's basically saying, so multivariate it means there's multiple responses. Multivariable means there's multiple variables. So, mm -hmm. like those are you know. Your responses are a function of your factors. And so we're talking about just a whole bunch of things that we've measured, different variables that we've measured. And so there's many different types of multivariate analysis. What I was talking about was principal components analysis, and there's like literally dozens of different types. So with the difference between multivariate and multivariable, so multivariable would be like f is a function of x and y, yes. and multivariate would be like f and z are both functions of x kind of thing? Um, F, say that again, that last part. <laughs> F and Z, or F and G, are both functions of X. Yeah. Because so, you're saying there's different responses. Yeah, so think about your responses in, like as a vector. Instead of just like Y, now you have Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, Y6. <laughs> and then over here, your X's might be X1, X2, X3. And they might be the same or they might be different. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so. Yeah, X1 through Xn would be your multivariable, and Y1 through Yn would be the multivariate. Yeah. Great questions. Any others? Okay, I got a question for you guys. Oh, please go ahead. I was just thinking that an 11 percent reduction is pretty significant, and I just—it's hard to believe that you guys could get that result and then not follow up on it past that. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of money to be made in something that could cause that much reduction. Yeah, yeah, that's why I'm so optimistic. This was in 16 weeks, so about four months, right? And they're doing not a lot more than just taking this medication. Okay, I got a question for you guys. What is a yoke? <laughs> it's a coyote. It's a oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I've always like wondered that. Like, I was gonna say go yotes, but it was like, what is a yote? Okay, I got it. It's coyote, but it's purple. Okay, a purple coyote. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much. Great to be here.